Welcome to the Entrepreneur Motivation Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Bello, and today we've got Catherine Brown on the show. Catherine, welcome. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's awesome to have you. And it sounds like we have some mutual friends and connections, which is always kind of fun to talk about before we hit record. But today we're going to be talking about the icky, sometimes icky subject of sales and how to get better at it and things that we should know and maybe reframing our mindset. But before we do that, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself real quick for the audience? Thank you so much. So my name is Catherine Brown. I do live in Houston, Texas, and I serve clients really all over the United States and North America. I have some programs that are growing that enable people in different places to listen to me, but those time zones work best for the things that are live training. And I have several industries that I work in, but as long as someone sells business to business, then for sure, the principles that I teach about mindset, how to qualify on calls, when to propose and how to close, those principles always work. Um, if someone sells another product or service, like I know you do in real estate, there are probably pieces of it that make as much sense, that make some sense, but others are a little bit different, you know, with a B2C type of sale. So right. I'm here today because I have recently launched my first book, which is called How Good Humans Sell. And I felt like it was really difficult to come up with a name, but I think I landed on one that a lot of people are resonating with because this is a problem is that people deep down and my research says that people deep down are worried that they're going to be perceived as too pushy and that holds them back in their actions sometimes. And that's where I get the word icky. Yeah. And I love that name, how good humans sell, because right there it's saying, they're good people. They're not slimy salesmen. How, it's not how slimy cars, you know, used car salesmen sell. It's how good humans sell. Like how how do you do it the right way? Because people love to buy, but I think they hate to feel sold. I've heard something along those lines where you don't want to feel like that you got the wool pulled over your eyes and you maybe made an investment that isn't the best investment. And so I'm really excited to talk about this topic. Where do you want to begin? Like, I, I mean, there's so many things in this thing, in this aspect of sales. Like, how do you even get over that feeling for those who are struggling with sales? How do you overcome those challenges? Yes. So, a couple things come to my mind first. One is that I think it's helpful to know that actually most people also worry about how they're being perceived. Yes. <laughs> there's, some, there's something there's something Perception. in psychology that's called there's something in psychology research that's called the spotlight effect and that idea is that we think the spotlight is on us and that people are paying such close attention that makes us feel self-conscious. Yeah. But the reality is that all the people you want to sell to and all the people I want to sell to they're very 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 busy. So the first place I try to help people understand is number one, if you're a human, you probably worry about this cuz most people do. Everybody wants to be a nice person. Most people want to be a nice person. They want to be perceived as a nice person. And that's a concern. Number two, people aren't paying as much attention to you as you think. That's right. the spotlight effect. And then the third is that I think that you want to start to understand that this belief that you're going to be perceived as too pushy if you ask again, if you ask for the meeting again, or you call or you send another email that concern makes people under ask. So what, what I see is that people actually don't even have an accurate perception mm -hmm. of what the other person is truly experiencing. And so our under asking means we're not even getting in front of them and they weren't paying as much attention as we thought to begin with. And then we literally dial back our actions, which makes us even less effective. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense because I, I have the same thing where I'm like, oh, I already messaged them or I, I left them a voicemail and I texted them. Let me give them a week or two. And especially in a, a business where it's time sensitive, like say on the investment side, uh, someone wants to sell their house ASAP and they're calling you and five other people. If you're giving them a week or two to think about it, they're going to go to the next person and you just lost an opportunity. So kind of exactly. knowing how frequently to check in is very important without you know, the fine line of being very annoying or like following up the right amount. So how do you even determine that? I guess it depends based on the client and the transaction, right? Right. The kind of thing. So your sale is very urgent. So what I would do, think if I were in that situation is I would just explain in a message. I would say, it's okay if you choose to go a different direction, but because of the 
the sensitive nature of this time frame, I'm going to try again this evening. I always leave voicemail, by the way, that, that's somewhat generational, but a lot of people have voicemail go to text. And to me, there's no harm in trying. So I leave messages still. I think they can work for you. And even if you call and the person doesn't respond, they'll usually see you in their missed calls, which also makes you top of mind. Yes. So, so I think it depends on what you sell. Um, I have a, a, a kind of interesting statistic I can share with you. Sure. Um, a lot of people, so I have a lot of friends that have marketing firms. I'm in a community of people that is a lot of digital marketing agencies. And I am one of the few sales professionals, full-time sales professionals that's in this in this community of, of marketers. So I read a lot of marketing material to keep up with them and to be able to give good referrals to them and things like that. So one of the things I keep up with is what is considered a good open rate. So think about the emails that you receive, or if you send email blasts to your list, you know, you'll hear every people say things from high 20s to, I mean, something like 40%, or if you had an individual campaign or a particular offer or discount, having a 40, 50% open rate for these one-offs is just amazing, right? But for regular email marketing, let's say you send out a message twice a month to your whole list and you send a newsletter having an open rate that's hovering around 30 percent many people would be ecstatic with that number that's i was like mine definitely aren't that high (laughs) right okay so let's say it's 30 percent. so and let's say that you're really vigilant like i'm pretty vigilant about asking permission the rules are looser in the us right but i'm pretty vigilant about asking permission and making sure someone wants to opt in and that periodically i cleanse it so if i don't hear from people it's it's uh, it's not likely they'll see the message if they don't follow closely, but I'll say I'll, I'll give it a chance to say, hey, is this serving you? Would you like to continue? And if I don't hear from you, I'm going to assume it's not good for you anymore. I non-responsive people after a while if there's no evidence of opening for several months. OK, so my point about that is that I have a, a real clean list. All right. So I've got a good clean list. I have permission based marketing. I'm giving away lots of value. I have an amazing open rate. And so let's say an average week I'm in the low 30s on my open rate, which I am. That means that 60 something percent of people who have chosen to follow, who are super fans and who don't take the the constant opportunities to to jump out that I give them, they're not reading the stuff. Yeah. (laughs) So if 30 something percent of people who know, love and trust us and opt in to hear from us, think about this. If one in three only read our stuff every time we send it out, how many more times are we going to have to try to get in front of someone with whom we do not yet have a relationship? Right. A lot more. more than three times. Right. <laughs> but, but most people will only try one or two before they kind of make up a story about that, feel embarrassed and give up. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. That's uh, very important to hear because two to three, like you said, one out of three people are actually reading the thing. And I, I'm actually guilty of this as well. Cause I look at mine and I'm, I sometimes just guess I'm like, yeah, I could split test, you know, change the subject lines, but I'm just going to email the same thing to everyone, whether they found me through my podcast or they're a real estate client. And I know you need to get, you know, dialed into your messages. Maybe a certain demographic of your audience wants to hear one thing and another group wants to hear something else. And so all those things play into it, but what I love about that is that it reminds us that it's going to take a lot more than we think to really get in front of them because the people who want to hear from us still are busy. So they're not really looking at our messages all the time and they don't unsubscribe, but they delete it. They're not even seeing us, right? So if we're now we're not talking about email us, now we're talking about someone that let's say, let's say I was introduced, I get a lot of business by referral for sales Mm -hmm. training, right? So I get a referral and let's say that we set a time to to visit. And then the last minute that person needs to reschedule. And for some reason it becomes challenging for us to get that meeting rescheduled. So I've had a warm intro. That was a pretty warm lead. And I don't want to let it, I don't want to let it go, but I might have to try, try, try several times, even though it was a relatively warm lead. How much more if there's someone I go after that I want to work, I pick you as a target account, I want to work with you, but we don't have a relationship. Maybe we have some similar connections on LinkedIn, but I mean, if I'm a prospector, if I am in a company, I'm a business development lead generator, 
I mean, I'm going to have to ask so many times because they literally, I think it's giving too much credit to say they're ignoring you. I think they literally don't even see you right. for a while. So if you make that mean something that is about you, then you'll definitely give up too soon. And so there's a lot about that mindset and the beliefs that you bring and the meaning that you give selling that gives you power or takes away power. Do you see that in your industry? I do. I do. And I mean, I'm working on ways of figuring out how to really get around that for me. And I know you said something about voicemail being generational. Like I'm, I never leave voicemail. I hang up and immediately <laughs> text them It very rarely. And then even when people leave me a voicemail, I'm like, why did they do that? Because most of the time they'll just text me as well because I tell them to in my, in my voicemail. So that was kind of funny. But one thing that I've been doing in my industry, and maybe this has to do with like my demographics and everything. Like I just, I turned 31 this month um, mm -hmm. just to kind of put some perspective on it. But love social media, always on it, update my stories, do live videos, all those things, but I never really use my phone to call very much. But what's been working for me is engaging with people, you know, they'll post on their stories and I'll reply like, "Oh my gosh, your dog's so cute" or "My cat does the same thing." You know, just try to relate to them and my name's popping up. They're saying like, "Oh, Chris messaged me today." "Oh, he he messaged me the next week." He he added value on my Facebook post or my LinkedIn post. And now that's my way of staying top of mind until they maybe come over to my profile, join my email list, maybe download my free guide, listen to a podcast, and they're in my web of content, which is exactly what I want. But is that what you've been seeing in, in your industry? Because I think that's really industry agnostic, if, at least in 2021. Absolutely. Two thoughts about that. One is that I do love email marketing because yeah. still because it it is not that important. I love having a high open rate. I'm I'm proud of that because I think we do give a lot of value with the the, the Friday emails I send out with sales tips. Mm -hmm. But it it doesn't hurt my feelings and it, in a way it doesn't matter that that not everyone's opening it because they still see my name in their box. Exactly, and, and right? the so, subject line's like the hook too. Right, exactly. So I really just want to stay top of mind and continually add value. So they think of me as a valuable resource when they have a need. And so that's why I do it. And mm -hmm. so it's okay if they don't always open. So I'm, I'm a fan of that for me. So I am, um, I'm, I'm pretty active on Instagram and I'm, I'm pretty active on Facebook still because there still are some marketing groups and entrepreneur and startup groups that are out there that are, are buyers for me, but mostly I doubled down on LinkedIn and then I've been on Clubhouse since January of 2021. And that's been really cool. That's yeah. been a really neat opportunity. So, so I, I'd say my order and where I get leads is for me in business to business, it's LinkedIn and then um, Clubhouse and then and LinkedIn, it has a big gap. Okay. So it's referrals, <laughs> then LinkedIn <laughs> in a pretty big gap. And then I would say Clubhouse Instagram and Facebook are pretty, pretty close. Okay. So, so I do all those, right? I do, I do participate in all of those, but, um, but, but LinkedIn put continually putting out content, um, being seen as a trusted guide. Um, that's one of the analogies that I talk about in how good humans sell is the idea that in sales, we're a guide. And if you think Chris about movies, how all the blockbuster movies, there's a hero of the story. The hero has a problem. Let's just talk about Superman for a second, right? Superman has a problem. He's raised, uh, he, he, he knows that he's really from another planet. He doesn't really know what his purpose is on earth. And, and he meets people. He actually sees his father, uh, Jarrell, and he has, you know, different people in his life who help him him figure out how to fulfill his full calling. Yeah. All right, you see the same storyline over and over. We could name lots of movies, right? Well, the thing for salespeople and the thing about social media where you want to show up and continually give generously of what you know and being a guide is because you are not Superman in this story, right? Your customer is Superman. And you're saying when you're ready to sell a house, you don't want to go at it alone because it's actually easy to make some mistakes. Here is a proven path of how you do it. Let me help you. And in the meantime, until you're ready to do that, I'm going to give you all kinds of things that make your life better so that when the right time comes, I'll be top of mind. You'll think of me as a valuable, trusted resource. You'll realize I want to guide you and you'll ask me to do that. And so that imagery of a guide, I think, is so useful because if you take a minute, you think about movies, think about 
Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter series, the Star Wars series, the heroes are always imperfect characters who need helpers. Yeah. <laughs> right? right. And the guide is Obi-Wan. The guide is Yoda. The guide is Gandalf. The guide is Dumbledore. They, they, they know stuff. Right. <laughs> they know stuff. And that's you. Right. And that's me. And so that helps me positionally think about the right role to play. Yeah, that's such great advice. Just being that resource and staying top of mind. I love what you said there as well. I wrote a few things down. I've just been jotting notes, but how you said it's okay if they don't really read your email because you're still, I have many email lists that I'm on that I'm like, sometimes I'll star it and I'm like, I'm going to get back to that. I want to read this one. This one sounds interesting, but I know it's a newsletter and it's not high on my priority. And I've got 50 other emails that need to get looked at ASAP. And so just being top of mind where now people are seeing your name and they know the resource part and the searchability because if they just mark it as read, whenever they're ready, they're going to search for your name and they're going to start looking through your old content. As long as you're staying consistent, you're staying top of mind. Uh, but then also what you said there about the guide, how we are that person and that per the other, I guess our clients are the heroes and whenever they need our help, they're going to reach out to us. That is a huge perspective shift because a lot of times we feel like we're the heroes, but other people they're the heroes of their own stories. They don't really care about us, right? That's right. Until they we're only it. the hero. We're only with the hero when we buy something, right? Yes, so and then exactly. if I buy you, then I become the hero again. But when I'm selling, it reverses, right? Yeah. Other, that that keeps you from showing up and just talking the whole time and spilling everything you know is is that you're carefully listening, you're asking questions, you're making right. sure you solve the problem they actually have because you are catering your answer to what they share, which then makes that ratio right where we make sure that on official sales calls, we don't talk too much. Exactly. I just saw somebody post about this in one of the real estate Facebook groups, how really good salespeople, and I don't know, maybe you have the updated statistics for it, but I think very, very good salespeople, they only talk about 10 to 20% of the time and the rest of the time they're listening. Whereas other people, I kind of tend to do that. I over talk and I dominate the conversation. We have to be very good listeners. So do you have a statistic or anything around that? Or is that kind of more or less? I say 70, 30, just from my okay. own personal experience, but I'm completely of the same general mindset. It's like yep. the majority needs to be them. And, and, and people are like, my gosh, how will I do that? Well, you have to practice your questions. Yes. Like you have to yes. have a and it can be a little bit scripted. I actually tend to open calls a pretty similar way. And I don't mind sharing, you know, what that is. I people people have responded to something. They've either initiated and scheduled themselves to have a call. They are a referral because someone who knows them knows they have a need, or um, or they've agreed to take a call. I, I was a professional cold caller for years. So I would reach out to people on other companies' behalf and I would set up discovery meetings, but I would have qualified them and they would have agreed to the meeting. It was a qualified appointment. So there's mm -hmm. some reason, no matter how we got here, there's some reason that you and I are now having this conversation. So what is it? <laughs> right. right. And so I like to use the word, I was, when I'm trained in my classes, I talk about how it's very helpful to use the word um, context. I'll say something, something along the lines to open up of, I read this, or this is how we got each other's names. Great to meet you. So would you give me some context for the call? So I know what is happening, you know, kind of where, where I'm, where I'm finding you and where I'm dropping in, in this situation, because um, it's kind of like a Jason Bourne movie. Like, you know, they always have to fight on the top of a train. This always mm -hmm. happens. Right? <laughs> so, so there's a train rushing by and it just happens in all these action movies. So the train is rushing, 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 rushing. That's our prospect. Their life is happening and going, going, going. And then we're drop in and we land on the top of a car and we have to say, where are we? Where, you know, where's this train going? And I can, I can be available. I can be fully attentive. I can be helpful, but I have to know a little bit of context. So I understand what you're hoping to get out of this call. Right. And that is pretty much off to the races. I mean, if I ask something about that and start to understand their goals, I can get them to share without me having to do too much talking so that I don't present about the wrong thing. I want to ask, 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 ask. And that just takes practice, I think, to figure out your favorite questions. Yeah, that's great. And it just it's something that I need to work on too, because I tend to just put them in a box like, okay, you want to buy a house or you want to sell a house. And I've got a presentation that I show everybody 
and you don't get to ask questions until the end, right? Versus having this approach where you're starting off with more of the questions and then you're tailoring your conversation based on what they need to do. Like, have they ever bought a house? That's going to be different than if this is their fifth house. They already know the process. They don't need to know all the basic first few slides that I'm probably going to talk about. And so being more questions based and was there, what was that exact question? You said something along, along the lines of, give me, can you give me some context? Context, right. The call, right. you know, what you're, what looking you're to working do. on, right. Or why you agreed to take the call cool. or it, right, what's happening. So for me, I, I could say, could you tell me a little bit about your sales organization? It helps me to have some context for this call. Okay. And you can also get a feel for how experienced are they, do they know how to use, like if you're selling software, do they know anything about software or are they just trying to figure out the difference between PDF and Excel? <laughs> right, 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 right. Well, I love your example, like just how many times they bought and sold a house. I mean, yeah. I, I've, I have moved more times in my life up in town now that I thought I, than I thought I would have. And so I've bought and sold a house several times and then I helped my parents and then I helped my, my sister and brother-in-law and then I helped yeah, my uncle. Experience. <laughs> I mean, I've probably been in the middle of, 10 or 12 transactions. Yeah. Um, just it just, you know, so far. And and so I I would appreciate if we were talking, I would appreciate being able to express that. Now, if I'm talking to you, it's because I still want to use a realtor, right? right? So like I still want help, but I, I definitely wouldn't want the first time buyer explanation <laughs> to have a chance to say, because then it like here's what would really get to the chase, right? Is if we were talking. And then you said, gosh, you've done a lot of transactions. I'm curious why we're talking. You probably know a lot of the steps to do. Yeah. And then you can just cut to the chase and say, yeah, I know the process. I'll, I'll let you know which houses just set me up on a search and I'll let you know when I'm ready to see some homes. And that's a lot different than, oh my gosh, how does this process work? We've never done this before. You know, I do, I've done that several times for several friends that are first time home buyers. And it is a different conversation entirely. And you're walking them through way more of the process than someone who may have done or been in between 10 to 12 transactions. Like you don't need the basic stuff, earnest money and option money and inspection, you know, all that stuff. Exactly. But it's interesting to me that you have that business and that your podcast host, because like, I think you just have to put on your podcast host hat and then you would have them do most of the talking. Exactly. I'm, I'm working on getting to be better at interviewing because a lot of times I'll stumble or I'll ask too many questions. And I always listen to my shows and I'm like, gosh, that was a dumb question. Or I said the wrong thing there because when you're on the spotlight, right, you're, you're kind of sitting there smiling, waiting for a good question. I'm like, what am I going to ask? I didn't really write a, a list of questions down because I want it to be organic, but mm -hmm. that really does help because I have the setup. I've got the lighting. So when the client jumps on the call, I'm just like, how's it going today? Like, how are you guys doing? You and your wife or you and your husband? And uh, what are you looking to do? And so that has really helped me become a better speaker and I guess interviewer versus mm -hmm. someone who maybe doesn't have that and they're not doing so many shows and they're kind of like awkward and they're not sure how to ask the question and you know they're not sure yeah, how to exactly. drive exactly. them through the conversation of what do we need to do and like let's get some urgency if we're going to make anything happen here sometimes i'll make a music analogy you know with selling uh -huh. and say it's kind of like um jazz music right that you have um, once you've had basic music theory and you understand keys and key changes, you know basic chord structure, you actually have memorized what we call in in in, in education curriculum language. They would they would talk about the um, the 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 appropriate scope and sequence for that age, right? And so the the grammar level, the elementary level of any subject is going to be pretty regimented, right? So music right. it there's this many keys, this is um, an interval of a third, this is an interval of a fifth, this is an arpeggio. You, you memorize and learn all those things. And after you have some, you know, some basic mastery over that, that foundational stuff, then you can start to improvise and you actually are free to riff off of that. So that's the way I really like to think about sales conversations is I know where I'm going to start and um, I have a and I have a good idea basically of how much time we have and and I know I want to understand the urgency and timing and I want to have a preliminary conversation about money. I want them at least to have a basic idea of what the services cost so that we don't go too long before they end up I don't want them to feel 
um, to feel tricked or to be or to be confused. And I want to do just some basic level setting pretty early in the conversation. If we do that in an intro call, and then we decide our next steps and we set that next call. If there, you know, if there's going to be a next call, then I'm pretty happy. I mean, those are really my only objectives is to is to qualify. Is this really a sales leader? Is it a marketing lead? Because if the timing is not relatively urgent, it's a marketing lead. It's not a sales lead. So is the sales or marketing? What's the context? What is what are their goals? What are they hoping to do? Start to get an idea of that. We may not completely finish it, but I have a sense of whether I can be a helper. And then we decide our next steps. And I think for me, Chris, something really shifted. I was actually teaching class earlier today about this, and I thought I need to articulate this a little bit differently. I think that people think that the purpose of learning to sell is learning to close. <laughs> <laughs> and, right. and so you have and you have movies and books and things that talk about always be closing. And that is so offensive. And it's just so unhelpful because being a realtor is a perfect example. How could the first realtor who ever sold me something, how could they know that I would be in the middle of 12 different transactions and only be in my late 40s? <laughs> right. Right. Like I still have more houses to do. Right. They have, you have no idea what that 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 hero's path is going to look like. And so and you don't want to make assumptions about mm -hmm. that. Right. Yeah. And so and so the purpose is of, of that sales call is to build a relationship and for you to figure out for this moment in time, am I the right help right now? And yes, you have to close it. Yes, you want to ask for the business, but the goal is not the goal is not to close every call we're on. And there are a few things that are commodities and so transactional or so the timing is so precarious that they really have to make a decision right now because um, like I have clients that sell bonds. When the bonds are all sold out, they're actually gone, right? So you actually do have <laughs> right. to make a decision really quickly. However, what's interesting is the relationship building business so that you're in a position to call them, have them call you right back and make a decision quick. That takes years. Right. Years. So it's very interesting because they have a long cycle, but they also have a short cycle in the in the immediate transactions. And so I think that there's different ways people define selling. And uh, it's not that I want to set up any unnecessary roadblocks that prolong a sale. But I think that a lot of times people define it by this is about this transaction. It's about getting them to close or not close. And I think that's short sighted. I agree. And there's it's. It really just depends on where they are, like you said. So when you do that intro call and you determine, are is it a sales or a marketing lead? Are they ready to do something today? Or are they kind of just starting to dip their toe in and see what their options are? And I've had the roller coaster of emotions too, where someone's looking at a nice priced home and I'm like, Ooh, this is going to be a good commission. And I know I need to put the client first, but I'm still kind of like seeing the dollar signs in front of my eyes. And then it goes from, this is a great opportunity to, oh, we decided we're going to wait another year to see what the market does. And you can kind of follow up and push and prod a little bit, but typically it's like, okay, once the decision's made, you have to honor that client. You can't annoy them to death or they're going to go elsewhere. And mm -hmm. so you nurture that lead, you keep them you know, top of mind, you follow up every few months. Hey, has anything changed? Let me know. I'm here if you have any questions, sending out those email newsletters, responding and engaging on social media. And lo and behold, whenever they are ready, they reach back out and it ends up being a relatively quick transaction. I'm just thinking of one that happened like that, where it was super exciting. Then they went away and then they came back and they bought a house in like three weeks and it was a huge commission check as well. So everybody was happy, awesome. um, myself included. And I was like, cool. Exactly. <laughs> well, the or, they, or they tell someone else, like, I'll tell you yes. that if, if I, if I were kind of jerking your chain by, um, you know, by, by saying, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this and then change my mind. mind. <laughs> right. Then, I mean, I would, you know, nice person. So I would feel bad. And I would really be on the lookout. Like I would look That's for awesome. other people to send to you in the meantime, because I would say, so sorry about our change of circumstance. We really appreciate what you did for us. The timing just wasn't right. Yeah. And I would be on the lookout. And that's why I think um, one of the, one of the things I really like to, to think about with selling is about how we're not just thinking about that transaction, but we're thinking about all the added value we can offer. So right. let's talk about those newsletters again for a minute. The thing sure. that's so cool about you getting 50 of them or, you know, how many of them you get is that it's not just that you are the possible consumer of that information. It's that when you read those, you're actually looking on behalf of all the people you want to serve. 
Right. But so what if you were to read those and say, I wonder, I wonder if so and so would appreciate, gosh, I talked to Catherine last week and you know, based on that conversation we had, I bet she would think this article was really cool. Exactly. Right? And then, you know, and you know, and then you share that. And so, and then when you forward that and say, Hey, I was thinking of you, and this reminded me of our conversation. Oh my gosh, like you thought of me, right? You thought of me, right. Like I think I think everybody feels that way. I think thank, thank you, thank you. So that is an example of added value. You might have sent me something that had to do with my business, not about real estate. Mm -hmm. But don't worry, I'm going to remember that you're in real estate and I'm going to connect those dots. And so I think that when we think about acting, reading, vetting, um, inspecting, keeping our eyes out on behalf of all the people that we that we want to serve and seeing ourselves as a resource in that way. Really, that's another way it elevates the role of the sales professional that makes you a guide who is appreciating my whole life. And 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 so back to your analogy with social media, like if, if you see I'm a dog person, and you share something with me again. I'm going to think, oh, he noticed I'm a dog person, right? Right. She doesn't just teach about sales. She's also a dog person. So you start putting this puzzle together of the things you know about me as a person, and when you reference those other aspects of my life too, I kind of think that falls in the whole good human category as well. I agree. And there's a perfect example. I just thought of this with a friend I met with a week ago and I'm big on productivity and virtual assistants and delegating. And so he was asking for some help with that. And I kind of taught him some things that I know, some software that I use, a couple of resources to check out. And there's a book that I'm reading now, which is like perfect. It encapsulates all the ideas I talked about and more. And I was just thinking like, I should order this on Amazon, just ship it to his house because he's going to find a lot of value in that since he's not quite where I am in terms of delegation. And he's going to always remember me when he sees that book of like, you know, Chris did this and he taught me this and bought me so much time back. And whether or not he ever works with me with real estate, he's, he's going to be on the lookout, like you said, because he's going to be like, man, Chris did all this stuff for me. And I'm not doing it because of that reason, but I know that the reciprocity, right? I just had Bob Berg on the show. If you heard of the, I the heard that episode, it was great. Yeah. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Yeah. That. He talks a lot about that. If you go and you, you're a go giver instead of a go getter, what goes around comes around and it's whatever you put out, it's going to come back. It's like that uh, law of reciprocity. That's right. That's right. And, and again, it's keeping the long play in mind, you know, like, yes. um, and the long relationship. I think that was something that when I was first learning to sell, I sold software and consulting services in my mid twenties. And if you look back, it's, it's very interesting because, um, you know, LinkedIn has been around a long time and I have a lot of connections. I've been collecting connections for a long time and I could have people I regularly talk with who were some of my first clients. I could still be in relationship with them. I've had multiple roles since then. I've had two different businesses since then, I have my current business, but I'm not connected to all of them. Mm -hmm. And I say that in an embarrassed way, not, not in something I'm proud of, but I think the first few years I was selling, I was just trying to get that grammar of selling down. And I was very commodity, you know, thinking in a commodity transactional sort of way. And I, I didn't understand that even though I was 27 and maybe they were 37, I didn't, I really didn't understand that I could have a relationship and that we could buy and sell from each other at different times over the course of our whole professional life. Right. So as a result, I didn't get to know that they were a dog person. <laughs> <laughs> I actually did, actually don't know, right? And I didn't I didn't invest in anything outside of showing up and talking about that contract and just dealing in this very specific sliver of life so that mm -hmm. when I went on to a different role, they didn't come with me relationship-wise and we lost connection and that's on me and it has to go all the way back to so just practice and you know, I yeah. forgive myself and you know, I'm learning and moving on but but I I do think that how long those relationships can keep coming back and pop up again and again. And I've, I've learned enough to know that we never want to say never. And you, you don't know the way your life will turn and, and the, the paths you'll take and where those relationships will be, will, will come up and have the opportunity again in the future. I think 
even more in what you sell. I mean, if you stay in this in this general lane, it's even more true for you than if you sell different things, you pop around to, you know, sometimes selling a product and sometimes selling a service. Yeah. And then one thing that I found funny lately is like, I can kind of tell who's my sales friends versus who has maybe like a day job because some people will post controversial or politically dividing things. And I'm like, you must not be in sales because you're trying to like turn away half your opportunities out there by <laughs> having these posts versus a lot of my sales friends are very good at, you know, navigating the situation and um, kind of, I, I guess, showing up in that way where, hey, we're here to serve your needs. I don't care what you, your beliefs are, or whatever. You voted for or whatever. Right. right. It's like, we don't need to talk about any of that. Which, what, what are your needs in terms of this transaction? But also long-term, when you know about them, and I guess there's CRMs and ways of managing that. Cause like a dentist, for example, I guess they had some notes in there because I hadn't been there for six months and the hygienist was literally like, so, Hey, last time we talked about, you know, you were going on this trip. How was it? And I'm like, how did you remember that? I thought that she, but then I realized, okay, she probably took some notes in the system, but still it felt great. And the massage therapist I just went to yesterday asked this, she's like, Hey, did you propose? And I'm like, I haven't even been here in like two months. And I don't think she took any notes down. She just remembered. I'm like, yeah, I actually did. And you know, this is how it worked. And, and so it, that stood out to me and I'm like, I'm going to come back to her. I'm going to tip her. Well, like she did an awesome job. We have a relationship now outside of just going, you know, for the service or whatever. That's right. And whenever she moves to the next thing, I'm going to want to stay connected with her and maybe I'll be able to support her. So the long-term vision for those listening don't just be short-sighted. Don't just try to sell whatever it is that you're doing now, because if you have that relationship, you can. it can be a life, lifetime of sales and connections both ways. That's right. I think I could give a final story too. Yeah. Um, I have a client, they sell to into banks and credit unions and okay. they um, sell to C-level executives. So usually, usually a CEO and CFO. And again, super takes a long time to build a long trusted relationship, but people don't move around in those jobs very much. So mm -hmm. you build that relationship. You could, you could have it for a long time and they could keep buying from you over and over and over. So I, I have a, a gentleman I was working with and we were setting up some goals that he wanted for himself. And a lot of times when I had to teach a class that incorporates selling according to values and setting sales goals, people will always have a money goal, right? Because I want to sell yeah. this much. I want to close this much, which is great. It's no problem. I always love to help them think through what will I do with that? Why is that important? And really get some achievement drive, really get some, some energy around get the why thing. tied to it. Yeah, why, <laughs> right? Why does this matter? And so that you will get up and do those habits every day to, to get that thing done. Yeah. So that's awesome. But this, this guy surprised me. He's, he's been very successful. He's done really well. He consistently has been a top performer for years and years and years. And he said, well, I'd like my goal to be to reach out to two clients a week and I want to have no agenda except to remember what else they've told me, especially about non-work, not about the thing I sell. And I want to just be casual and make make a high call is what he called it. That's cool. And I thought that was so interesting. He quantified it. He made it a goal. And he said, and I, so we talked about time triggers, like how will you remember to do this or habit bundling is another concept, right? So it's mm -hmm. like, he actually said, well, on these days, I need to be home a bit earlier. So I actually could um, call them the end of day, but still within a business hour. So I think I might do it as I'm, as I'm driving back and I have my commute. So he's even thinking like, when will I do it? So I really do it regularly, but he's so long-term minded that he has part of his plan that he's just reaching out to say, hey, did your daughter graduate? Hey, how'd this thing yeah. go? What did you end up choosing for school? Right, and just keeping up with that information with people. And that is just, it's like, no wonder he's such a high producer. Right, that's such a good thing. And I mean, the go-giver mentality, I've read that book a while ago and I've heard a few you know, sales podcasts talk about that very thing. Just think about the long-term and there's no such thing as a bad prospect. And you never know, even if that person's not ready, they may have someone they know who is ready and could become a transaction today or, you know, to benefit you. Cause obviously sales, like you, you want to close deals, you need to earn an income. So we have to kind of measure that a little bit, but thinking about it long-term, or if you actually take notes and you ask, I, I like how you said it was called a high call, just saying, hi, how are you? How's your daughter? Did she graduate? Um, how's everything going? People like to do business with people they know, like, and trust. And they're going to like you a lot more if you're calling to ask about their, their family. <laughs> 
them. Yeah. Instead of you calling them to ask like, Hey, are you ready to buy? Right. Cause I have a few people who do that. And I'm like, anytime they ask me for anything, I'm just immediately like, I roll my eyes. I'm like, I, I bet I know this, what this is going to be. They're trying to sell me again. I already said no a million times. Why am I still Facebook friends with this person? You know, I have a few of those. And then I have a few of the others, like you talked about that. I always feel good when they reach out, we have a great conversation, nothing about work. And they come top of mind whenever I need to do that thing that they do, I reach out to them first. I had, I met a guy on Clubhouse that has, is, is in charge of a big purchasing department for a very large company. And he said that a good an amount of the time his agents call whoever called them most recently. That's awesome. Just top of mind awareness. It's just a case where like, it might have been that you did leave a message or you sent a text or they didn't open your email marketing, but your name is out there and you didn't give up. And that that kind of feedback, hearing these uh, anecdotal stories like that, I mean, it just fuels me to do my outreach and not give up because you don't know what's going to happen. You really don't. And that's that's super inspiring. I was just talking with another real estate friend the other day, how he was telling me it's been a slow month last month, but this month's going to be really good, like six or seven deals under contract, things are picking up. And I said, that's the beautiful thing about sales and business and just reaching out consistently because you may have a slow month, you may have a great month, but as long as you're consistently doing the actions that you're set out to do, things can change so quickly. You know, you can turn things around, you can have a great profitable month, help several clients and be killing it versus sitting there, you know, crying about what's not working and not taking the actions that you set out to do. Two different scenarios entirely. Right. Plus it makes your energy weird with when you then have to dig yourself out of the doldrums. Yes. You get in a funk and it, it happens to all of us. I've seen good sales guys that just, they didn't close deals for a month or two. And they're like, it's getting in their head now. And they just feel like they can't have the conversations the right way versus that person who seems like they're killing it all the time. Like the guy you talked about, they're always in the zone. They're always in a good mood. They're top producers. You know, it's very interesting to see how just having the right mindset impacts your calls and your tonality and the conversations and the and the deals that you're able to do. Um, mm -hmm. But I know we've got a couple of minutes because you got to prepare for your next appointment. But is there anything that we missed or any last key takeaways that you'd like to add for the audience today? Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, I guess just finishing up what you were saying there, I, I share sometimes in my training, I share this circle and I have half of it, I have a line down the middle and one half says beliefs and the other half says processes. And I'm making the case that sales success, the beliefs about what you think is possible for yourself and what you think selling is, it's so important. It's 50% of the process. Yeah. And the how to, when to send a proposal and what to say and what to, how, how to test a soft close and how to get a verbal, you know, a verbal, verbal confirmation before you send over the PO. All that stuff is technique that falls in the other half. I'm not saying it doesn't matter. I'm just mm -hmm. saying that's how much beliefs matter. That's amazing. I, I just drew that out because if you don't believe it, you're never going to try it. I read that in a book as well. It's like, if you don't believe it's possible, you're never even going to attempt it which means you're not going to get the outcome versus if you believe and you take the actions with that belief, if you have the systems and, and processes in place, obviously you're going to deliver on that um, amazingly, but you have to have that belief. Right. And if you think sales is disrespectful, dishonorable, and sleazy, then it doesn't matter how much your company invests in giving you the process piece because you won't use them. Right. That's the hard part too. But I, I mean, I've gotten better at that. But when I first started, I'm like, gosh, you know, I don't feel like I'm selling a bad product because it feels amazing to me now when I'm able to see that client move into a home and they're like, thank you, Chris. Like they're, they send me the pictures with their keys. We're so happy. You feel good versus if you don't believe in what you're selling, oh, it's going to yeah. be a bad time. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love what you sell. I mean, I've thought many times how much I would enjoy being in real estate because I, what you're selling is the transformation of the experience. Yeah. Right? In their the, lifestyle, their dreams. How, those, how their how their life will be playing out in this new space. So totally. I mean, I think that I think that keeping a belief about why it matters 
I see that even more clearly yes. for what you sell than what some people sell. I, I think anything, I really think that just about anything can be a tool towards someone's success and it can mm-hmm. be framed that way. Some things are just a little easier to get there with than others. Totally agree. Well, yeah. we talked about so many great things and I jotted down a whole page of notes and I really appreciate your time, Catherine, and for you jumping on the show. Where can our listeners go to learn more about you, to check out your book and maybe um, any other podcasts that you've been on? Thank you so much. So I'm on all social channels. The very best thing to do is to go to my website, which is extra bold sales, E X T R A B O L D extra bold sales.com. I've got all my social handles there. Um, There's quite a few videos on YouTube with free training and other podcasts out there. Um, I'd love to put our, our copy of this out there um, as well. Uh, hopefully pretty easily findable. That's my goal. (laughs) I love that about social media these days. You can just type in someone's name and boom, you're on their website. You send them a DM. You're (laughs) you're on a consultation call like two days later. I know. Technology is incredible. But thank you, Catherine. I will be sure to link that up in the show notes so that everyone can easily access it and reach out slash connect with you. Thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you once again.